don't know who Superman is. <laughs> Watch this. Oh! Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack from Superman's Comics, and we are here like we do every week with that new comic book day show. That's right. This is the Bolo Show, the Be on the Lookout. We're talking about all the good books that are coming out. I guess came out because this always comes up the day after new comic book day. But we're talking about first appearances. We're talking about the Reader Buzz books, Variant Buzz. And then, of course, Jack offers the long-term play. I've had people comment on other videos. Hey, where is the long-term play? It is right here in the Bolo Show each and every week. And we're going to get to that a little bit later on. But Jack, how's your week been so far? So far, so good. So, you know, this is a long weekend. But uh, I work in retail, so this is that time of the year. I don't work in retail. My weeks have been long. I am looking forward to Christmas vacation right around the corner. But either way, let's get into it right now, starting with those first appearances. This week, we just got one for you, but it's a good one. And it's been sneaky. It started selling out online. But we're talking about that DC Mary Multiverse. And why is that? Yeah, well, we have the first appearance of Kid Quick. And I don't expect you to know that name. I would expect you to go who? But that is the Future State Flash, that character that we've been seeing in all of the Future State advertisement. I don't love that he first appeared here. Um, I feel like if this happens more and more, you're going to start devaluing those uh, first Future State books. Um, and I certainly don't think DC got any sort of sales bump off of this because nobody knew this was coming. Um, this is a $9.99 cover price book that had a bunch of stories and um, this was an appearance no one saw coming. So this has a good chance to be an in-demand book if the character in Future State as a program ends up going anywhere. Um, certainly with the Flash television show and the fact that we've seen other versions of the Flash already show up in the Flash television show. And what we just talked about the night previously on Three Up, Three Down. Uh, if you haven't seen it, be sure to go check it out this week. Very special All Up episode six up. Um, but we talked about the CW universe and the fact that they're really heading towards kind of like a Young Justice um, sort of a situation and with the future state characters already being introduced like Yara Flores. So um, kind of the sky's the limit with this one, but I, I wonder if this isn't going to uh, affect some of the popularity of the future state books, um, which already were going to be complicated with like characters showing up in multiple books, releasing the same day. Uh, you know, it was already going to be a messy first appearance situation, but um, this is a book to pay attention to. It's got, got a lot of, um, long-term possibilities but i also don't expect it to be a book you're going to see at your lcs uh, i can't imagine too many people were paying uh five dollars wholesale to order this book of just basically christmas stories yeah they usually pick up a couple copies i know my lcs are carrying i usually pick it up every year just because it's like mm -hmm. the christmas book and yep. I, I like to read it and take my mind off of continuity and everything and just enjoy good good christmas dc superhero snowball fights <laughs> <laughs> That's it for first appearances. Thanks for coming out. But we're gonna we're gonna go right now into those reader buzz books. First one we're talking about is one that everyone's high on, like we talk about plug and play. But here we are with Venom number thirty one. Yeah, King and Black tie in, and we talked about how yeah, there's you can say that about a lot of things, but certainly the Venom book uh, is the book where you're gonna have more kind of story movement within the King and Black story. So. Um, there's going to be added attention on this series uh, in general right now. Any book with that King and Black logo on the front, I think is going to get um, extra attention. Yeah, it just seems like it should be like a Metallica cover art or something. But either way, moving on to the next one, the Reader Buzz books. Here's one that we don't talk about too often, but we've talked about it a couple times over the past few months. And we were talking about Avengers with Avengers number 39. Yeah, and this may be all hype. We don't know yet. Uh, but Avengers 39 starts off a brand new Phoenix story that Marvel, at, you know, Marvel just had an opportunity doing a Comic-Con in Brazil, um, which was like the first uh, sort of comic convention where they were able to go and, and kind of present things and talk about things. And Marvel was heavy talking about this being an important arc um, and that this story is going to really change things and reset things in the Marvel, um, in the Marvel universe. But I'm skeptical because every time Marvel tries to give me the hard sale and this is going to be the big thing, uh, a lot of times we end up with War of the Realms, Empire, things like that. Um, so we'll see. Uh, it's definitely, if you're not a regular Avengers reader, this may be worth grabbing and seeing if this story is going to interest you. Um, this is, uh, of course, we're talking about um, 
the the stuff that kind of went on with Jason Aaron's Thor run with the uh, with Phoenix. So we're not we're not talking about say X Men. Um, we're talking, uh, you know, this is going to be Jason Aaron's big, big, big story. I have a lot of faith in Jason Aaron, um, but just Marvel putting it out there that, hey, pay attention to this, doesn't necessarily in and of itself sell me, but worth grabbing up, I think, for Reader Buzz alone. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge Jason Aaron fan, and I tend to like Avengers more than I like X-Men. That's going to bring us to the next one. We get sword number one. We talked about this on last call, but I'm just not too hyped on it. So if you guys have picked this up, if you read it, and you think it's one worth picking up, let us know and I'll give it a read. But for right now, I've kind of passed on it. Yeah, yeah. And we've talked about the, these kind of properties not being something that we, we've really been invested in. But at the same point, people have been vocal with us telling us that they are. So yeah, kudos, more power to you. Like we, we, we practice what we preach. We respect people's fandoms. So you know, if people want to get into this uh, British sect of the Marvel Universe, I'm all for it. I'm all for it being good too. Um, it's just my previous dalliances into like the Revolutionary War and things like that I didn't necessarily enjoy. Um, it also felt a little over my head. So I, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, yeah, I'd love to see you saying. Let us know in that comment section how you guys are digging this. Yeah, um, just like Jack said. And we say it all the time. Buy what you like. This is one I didn't buy. Yep, me too. But the next one is one I did buy and this is one I'm super excited about. And we got another image book with Homesick Pilots number one. Also, one of the, some great covers, and then friend of the channel, 616comics.com. Go over there. You can get their store exclusive as well. Yeah, that's right. Another Megan Hutchinson banger. And on top of that, serious, serious, serious crossover Easter eggs yeah. uh, from the man, Donnie Cates himself, on the cover of that book. That's all I'll say there. Um, but Homesick Pilots was a really a well-anticipated number one. Maybe flying a little under the radar of where I, I thought it would be at this time. Um, but Image has had a great year. Yeah, uh, it's almost like Image in 2011 again. We're going to get Peter Panzerfaust out, back out soon. Yeah, Image got their butts kicked in 2019 by uh, Boom Studios. So just to be frank, I mean, it just it is what it is. They got their butts kicked by Boom. Um, and they really rebounded well this year. Um, I would say they probably uh, were equal, if not Image maybe had, had a lead this year. Um, it, Boom still continued to put out quality. They put out maybe less big name releases uh but continued also they're like something's killing the children some of their juggernauts like once in the future um but image has been coming out with new number ones uh you mentioned that peter pan's a frost editor brian and i always like to reference that because it's when we remember there's certain books that you remember manifest image destiny. number one came out you bought it yeah manifest destiny is one i think about um you know you you bought up those image number ones and we were buying handfuls of them. um and and in for good reason, because there was a time where you'd buy Nailbiter, you'd buy Southern Bastards, and you'd buy them for, for $3 the, the day they came out, because comics cost a little less back then. And uh, it, they were 10 bucks that same day. They, I mean, they just people couldn't get enough of these image books. Um, and you'd go to store after store that wouldn't have them, and then you'd walk into that one indie store that would have a rack full. And that was, man. You, just <laughs> you could just like, take, walk out take a crappy picture with your phone, get into your car and post it on eBay with the crappy picture and it would sell. Quick sell. I can't tell you how many car dashboard pictures I, I was selling during that Todd, era. the ugliest kid. Oh my God. Yeah, so, so, so many uh, Manhattan projects. Um, just that whole era of uh, image number one. It, it, up until that, like we talked about uh, on Three Up, Three Down, so that, that, that uh fraction and Zdarsky set criminals and all of that so we're getting back into that it's good to see image um making those moves i hope this is one that continues reader buzz beyond issue number one um this was one i read a preview of a while ago i need to kind of reread it I'll refresh but let us know in the comment section what you guys thought of homesick pilots yeah we're going to skip this next one for a minute and stick with image because they also had crossover number two that came out this week as well yeah, it's another huge buzzing issue. A um, lot of late breaking reports about kind of characters from outside of the Image Comics universe showing up. Um, there's certainly a lot of attention on issue number three with the Todd McFarlane cover and Spawn front and center on the cover. Um, very, very, very exciting times. Um, and, and, you know, you look at like the crossover number one cover um, that, you know, we took part in with the 616 comics. They had right on that cover. Well, Megan Hutchinson had right there. We had Negan, uh, you had Savage Dragon. You, you got to kind of read between the lines. And it was right there. That this, this 
this series is one of those ones where the anticipation is building, um, I think, with each issue of people trying to figure out, like, what is the scope of this thing that Donny Cates is doing? Um, and we don't know yet. So it's fun. It's like you said, I get excited when we have stuff like this that just is getting people's attention. Um, on top of it, this series and image in general, they're, I know some people hate this, but I like it as, as a retailer, as a reseller. I like the variant covers and the fact that they're doing incentives for it, um, especially beyond issue number one. We've seen that with like Philadelphia. We've seen that with uh, Department of Truth. I'm glad to be seeing that in this series as well. Right. And we just talked about issue number three the last week on Last Call at Head FOC. So be on the lookout for that as well. Absolutely. But the one that we skipped over that we're going to talk about right now, and this is one of the favorites we've talked about on this channel. We've talked about like we think it should be an issue 20 because of all the later printings for all the issues. But we're talking Strange Academy number six hit store shelves this week. Yeah. And you got a first cover appearance. So I think that there's some chance that that cover A could get some attention. Um, I know that some people are kind of on that first cover appearance thing. Some people don't care, but um, that's worth noting at least because there was a time where until we got that late breaking kid quick uh, notification, I thought we were going to have no first appearances this week. And in, in no first appearances, I actually thought first plug and play, like you mentioned, it feels like we're on issue 20 because there's been so many releases in the series. I expect this issue even uh, to sell out and end up being one that we're looking at late printing as well. And then switching over from Marvel to IDW, we get that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 112. Yeah, the final issue in this arc, um, highly anticipated issue, um, if nothing else, sadly, because there's so much anticipation for 113. Um, and the events that look to be taking place on the cover there. Um, I haven't had a chance to check this issue out yet. Um, let us know in the comments section. I'll tell you what my thought is. We're filming this on Tuesday. Um, going into reading this issue first thing tomorrow morning is, will there be a panel at the end of this book where uh, adult Lita reappears? Or will we have to wait for the cover on 113? We don't know. Uh, so that, but either way, uh, this is one to be paying attention to. Um, you we mentioned it a couple of times. The 616 Comics has an uh, exclusive that we partnered with them on from Hal Laren. That is a uh, cover homage to TMNT number one, which features the four predominant female characters from the series, Al Opex, Mona Lisa, um, Jenica, um, and uh, uh, Sally Ride. Um, so, you know, be sure to check that out. And, you know, I think this is one that's going to get some attention um, because the reader buzz on this series is incredible right now. People are paying so much attention to everything going on with Ninja Turtles. Yeah, so much so that older Ninja Turtle books have been getting picked up. Yes. But we talked about crossover on here, but here's another book that's not entitled crossover, but it's a great crossover nonetheless. We got Sandman Lock and Key number zero. Yeah, this was like a late announced edition um, after the Lock and Key Sandman number one, uh, kind of like hush hush solicitation that went out to retailers. And I say hush hush because we've been working on a exclusive for this one that we started when we began exclusives and still hasn't even been announced yet. Um, so this was a a much delayed project. Um, so I like the idea of having a zero issue get out there and to get people ready. There was already the beginnings of this crossover um, in that uh, locking last lock and key mini series. Um, so. This is one that has some opportunities because we know that Sandman is coming to Netflix. Um, we know that Lock and Key is already in Netflix. I'm not suggesting there's gonna be a Netflix crossover. I'm not saying there can't be, but I'm just saying that this is gonna be a good way to introduce Sandman, I think, to an audience that maybe has never been exposed um, to Sandman before. Um, and it, either way, and it's new comics, new Sandman comics for Sandman diehards, which is a sect of the community that exists that it's it, people. That is a a a property and a character um, that resonates with a certain percentage of our community. Yeah, definitely a lot of Neil Gaiman cult, as if you could say. But yeah, Sandman's definitely got some following. But the last one we're talking about in the reader buzz. I like talking about this one. I'm glad it's last because I think it epitomizes the Reader Buzz section of the Bolo Show. And we are talking about Seven Secrets, number five. How often do you talk about number five issue? But this title has been one of my favorite from Boom. A lot of people talking about, you know, 
something's killing the children They're talking about some other books that have got higher buzz seven secrets has been one of my favorite reads and number five is fantastic and i love 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 the Derek chu covers on these Yes, and, and I, I especially love them because they kind of give me the feel of our exclusive for number one that we had from Jung Young Yoon. Um, so I like seeing that aesthetic then being represented from the publisher as well. Um, you mentioned it, this issue number five. And why is this issue on here? Pure reader buzz. Um, this, this is a, a series that has started to creep towards hitting the reader buzz section the last couple issues. Um, issue number one, I'll be honest with you, wasn't loved. It, it was... It was kind of people on the fence about it. Now, we had read issue number one and two at the same time, and we were telling people it's going to really pick up an issue two. You're going to want to stick around. And it did. But there were still some people who were on the fence. Issues three and issue four have brought people to the series, and it's one of those series that I see people really anticipating, um, as well as being a series that other comic creators are talking about regularly on Twitter that they, it's a series that they're reading. And that is a, a big, big, big deal. Behind the scenes, we know that a lot of people like to speculate on which properties are gonna be like the movie properties for this company or that company. And a lot of times they base those on comic sales numbers. Well, I'm just gonna say that that's not what Hollywood bases it on. That's not what they're looking at. And they look at um, properties and how they can project them. I think Seven Secrets is one that's gotta get a lot of attention. Um, and it's, it's, it's a big deal because Tom Taylor coming to Boom Studios was a big deal. And I, in this book, if you like this book, it's, it's largely due to Tom Taylor's writing style and the way that he kind of hits you with almost like something action packed that leaves you kind of, not necessarily a cliffhanger, but leaves you ready for that next issue at the end of every issue. And I, I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy that. Uh, I like his pacing. Um, and I think that Seven Secrets can work on so many different levels in the next multimedia, whether it's an animated anime type feature or a live action, I don't think it matters. Um, to me, Casper is very much a uh, indie Miles Morales, which is why we chose one of our second print exclusives to do the homage to uh, Ultimate Fallout 4. Um, and that's a book that didn't necessarily sell well, but was one that we we're really, really proud of to bring those to market. But I'm just happy to see people jumping on board of this book. And I encourage everybody, if you haven't gotten a chance to check this book out, to do so, and whether or not you do so digitally, or you pick up the upcoming trade, or honestly, the back issues are available at cover price. You could pick up one through five right now, cover price. Um, and it's, it's an amazing, amazing read. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about here on this channel through other shows, how great we like Tom Taylor on Deceased, mm -hmm. on Suicide Squad, on Injustice. I like him so much more on Seven Secrets because it's the universe that he's created. He's yep. not taking another property already. He's creating this universe. He's creating these characters. The interior artist, I'm not going to say the name because I'll butcher the heck out of it. Fantastic interior artist on this and the cover has been fantastic as well. Love this story. Kudos to Boom on this. And that's not just because we're Boom homers because I'll admit it, I am. But for a reason, they're putting out great stories. And Seven Secrets is probably one of my favorites. I said it before. I'll say it again. If you're not reading it, Give it a read. Let us know what you think. But that wraps up the reader buzz section. And I can't think of any better way to do so. But we're going to get into that variant buzz. We got the variant buzz. We get that Conan number 17. We got that nullified variant. Yeah. And it's interesting because we just talked about this artist, EM Dis, on the top 10 show that we did for those DC uh variant month covers um not an artist that you see like everywhere um it's super prevalent uh very unique art style he did a deathstroke number 11 monsters variant that we highlighted as being a really dried up book um and this was one that was popular right off the bat because a lot of these nullified variants like a lot of the venomized variants they start to look redundant you know everybody kind of does the same thing very different art style on this one certainly a property like conan very different one that you would think is ridiculous but now with all the history we're getting with null and his like eternal origin and um, his, his dating back to stuff with Thor, um, it's as legitimate as any other book. So I like this book. Um, it almost gives you a little bit of a Frazetta feel. It almost gives you a little bit of a feel of that, uh, the uh, Black Cape Comics Venom variant that they released recently. Um, so it's that type of aesthetic. If you like that kind of almost gothic horror look, I think this is a great, great pickup. Um, I was glad to see a cover B do well just based on the art alone. So the next variant we're talking about on the variant buzz section, we talked about this on the last call as well for FOC, where we get that Batman black and white. Number one, 
specifically that gorgeous peach momoko variant. That's it. I said it. Gorgeous peach momoko. You don't hear that coming out of my mouth too much, but this is one that I actually really like. Yeah, her art style really played well into this Batman black and white aesthetic, um, as well as I like the fact that she did a different character than you see on all the other covers with her doing Talia al Ghul um, for a cover art subject. So I thought that was kind of cool. I liked all the covers for Batman Black and White. There was really a book that's under the radar. I kind of expected a month ago when we were talking uh, around yeah, last call Yeah, it's just time. a title that doesn't ever really seem to yeah, fly off shelves. <laughs> really, really doesn't. But it's one that at, at points, the back issues have gotten valuable, uh, mostly due to cover art. But yeah, every time they release it, it doesn't Or seem... statues do well. <laughs> statues, yes. That statues. I think that's why they keep producing the series is I think it's been an inspiration for a lot of, of toys and statues. Uh, they've done action figures as well from the Black, Batman Black and White series. Um, so it's also been where a lot of writers have kind of cut their teeth in the Bat family um, and then gone on to then do things in other parts of the, the, the DC universe. But uh, a lot of great Peach Momoko came out this week. Uh, there was at least three major covers that I could think of, um, but this was one of them. Right, and the next one we're talking about getting over to Dynamite. We get that Vampirella Dark Powers number one. This had several variants for it. My favorite of the course is that homage, homage, home ages. I like that Soup Spider-Man number one homage. Yes, um, this, this is a book that actually I, I, I kind of dig long-term. Um, and I really wanted to almost make an argument for it for the long-term play this week. Um, I, a lot of the variants are selling out, uh, kind of on a pick what you like, but I think that's largely due to the fact that it's a trend I've noticed over the last several weeks, one that I almost highlighted on 3Up3Down, three three is I think large retailers are ordering less dynamite sellers because it's, or less dynamite in general, because it seems like some of the books are starting to sell out and they're not really doing anything on the secondary market, which indicates that probably it was less total covers ordered so that even though the books are selling out it's not like the supply is short of what the demand is it kind of is meeting it accurately well they do give marvel a run for their money with the amount of covers they put out oh they make more covers than anybody or actually. or they might have four covers but it's actually 17 yeah they make more covers than anybody because they do like one in seven one in ten one in eleven one in fifteen one in twenty one in twenty i mean it gets nuts um but a lot of the covers for this book were selling out why do i see this one as long-term value the new Vampirella costume, which I know has been panned by most of the community. Why do I like the new Vampirella costume? Well, because the old Vampirella costume was the most limiting thing that was ever gonna happen to that character. If you ever think that that costume was gonna work in a feature film in 2020 and beyond, you're nuts. It just isn't gonna work. Uh, it's not, that's an adult film costume at this point. Um, it, you're not going to get a respected actress to want to step up and play that character. Um, and you see that. Elizabeth play. Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. Hey, now, say by Bell reboots, huh? But, uh, Show you know, girls. It's, it's one of the, uh, so trust me, I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> but but uh, it, it's, it's one of those things. Um, uh, it, I think that this is good for the long-term health of the character. Do I think there's going to be some pushback initially? Sure. Um, you certainly see it in the variant production. Um, because people try to get the most sexualized cover. Um, I even saw a store, I love the cover, it was a great design, but I even saw a store go so far to get a, around the costume that they, they did a exclusive with John Royal, an artist I absolutely love, where she's in the bathtub and the costume is like hanging on everything. So it's like, you know, they, they went out of their way to try to not show that costume. But um, this is, a, I think, a first appearance of the character in costume. Um, if this could be the costume when we finally do see like Vampirella play out on the, on the main, um, main stage, whether a television show or movie that she's m more than likely wearing because that, uh, that lingerie costume just wasn't going to fly. Yeah. Some Vampirella pasties. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on. Next one we're talking about, we talked about these before. But we got those Savage Dragon late prints. We got the Charlie Brown, and we got another one of that Biden Harris, right? Yeah. So you got the Biden Harris cover, same cover, but this one instead second of print, third, yeah. second print of that and third print of the Charlie Brown one, I believe. Yes. And the, so the Biden Harris, it's they just changed the wording in the word bubble from you know support Biden and Harris to uh, you know congratulating Biden and Harris. The value of that long term is going to be like how prominent and these characters end up becoming as as, as individuals and politicians um 
certainly if Kamala Harris becomes president one day, this could be a big deal. Those are the kind of things that you see um, spike in the market. But it, it, this, that's always tough speculation. But it's a great pickup for cover price. And then the Charlie Brown cover, I like that they did this. Um, I think it's a great to release it at the same time because it's kind of like, well, if you don't want to get political, if you don't want, if you, you're, you're leaning the other way, uh, here's, a, here's a completely fun, lighthearted cover. Um, they just did a simple color change though from like the, the local comic shop day book, which had the orange background, this one with the purple background. I don't love that, but um, the Good Grief Charlie Brown cover. Um, still, Peanuts fandom within the comic community is loyal, it's long lasting, and I expect people to pick this up. I like both of these long term. Yeah, I mean, Peanuts is Charlie Brown's pop culture staple. You see, you know what it is. So a lot of people be like, I don't know what the F Savage Dragon is, but I know what right. that is. I'm going to get that up, pick that up. That's going to my uh, Peanuts collection. But next one, we're getting back over to Boom, and we get this Mighty Morphin number two. They had some Peach Momoko variants for this, and they're still hot. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, there's at least three. I could probably miss some because there was a Vampirella, um, Dark Powers. Uh, we talked about the other one and then now we have this one here you've got two versions of the cover um it's continuing that same like aesthetic with the like the bus where you see like half the face and half of the helmet it's like the I, montez but peach does their own her own flavor type with those colors right. resemble similar exactly and i like it because it very much is in peach's style but i like i like series of variants so you have like a similarity between the variant programs. So if you get on one, you can kind of yeah. put together. And it's great because you got a high roller set and you got a more affordable set. Exactly. So they, they kind of hitting both price points. At the same point, I know that some Ranger fans have been negative about it. Um, I think Ranger fans, positive and negative, are very used to a certain aesthetic. And when we started doing Power Ranger variants, that was one of the tough things we had to try to navigate is you want to hit them with an aesthetic that they're familiar with but at the same point you want to push the medium you want to start bringing in artists outside of what's typical um but power rangers community they the shiny helmet look um that that almost digital rendering is kind of king within that community so they haven't necessarily been as receptive to the peach momoko covers as other communities it, it, within comic collecting have um but i expect long term this is by far the largest name that has done a Power Ranger variant to date. Uh, I would also say a slept on book is that In Hyuk Lee incentives that came out. This was a great looking cover, but I think more attention goes on the, the Peach cover. So the In Hyuk Lee cover flies under the radar, but kudos to Boom to really like throwing big names out there into the Power Ranger variants. That was not what you saw early part of uh, the, the run originally although great artwork, they tended to be more within that kind of like universe of Power Ranger artists. Yeah, I, I definitely get the point where you're talking about with, you know, some of the hardcore OG Power Ranger fans aren't liking it because, I mean, I, I'm not that hardcore a Power Ranger fan, but everyone knows I like Master of the Universe and I like Thundercats. And I felt the same sort of way when they brought Thundercats back as another cartoon. It was almost like that Teen Titans, mm -hmm. the, the, the noon Teen Titans or Teen Titans Go style animation. And it was was not my Thundercats and I felt kind of slighted. But either way, we're gonna go into the last one on the variant buzz and we're sticking with Power Rangers, but this time we are talking about Power Rangers number one, that second print Franny variant. Yeah, and really want, variant at that. Yeah, and that's why I wanna highlight not just this, but the Mighty Morphin number one that came out last week. Um, I think long-term these books have a great shot. Um, Franny is a very similar style to Peach. I think she's kind of drafted well off of the popularity of Peach. But all of the things that I think a lot of people don't like about Peach, I think for any kind of answers, her line work is a little clear. Um, it's, it's, it's more um, developed rather than conceptualized. Um, and this cover is an awesome, awesome cover. I love the colors. It almost has a crayon or like acrylic walk, like, like, uh, like watercolor -y kind of look. Um, I, I, I really dig uh, the color on it. Um, the connecting cover set. I also think the fact that there were two different variants um, including the Dan Mora ones, which featured new characters, which I think people were really paying attention to. I think the printing on this, uh, these Frannies is going to be low. Great, great long-term holds for Power Ranger fans. That, so far, we've gone through the first appearance, that, that heavy, heavy first appearance this week. We touched on those reader buzz. We just finished up the variant buzz. So that leaves us with just Jack's long-term play. And 
for the long-term play again this week, Jack is doubling down. He's going full Vince Vaughn from Swingers. That's right. Double down, baby. So money, so money. But we got the last run again for the long-term play. We had the second print hit this week, as well as that one in 75. Thank you, Varian. Yeah, and I couldn't pick just one. So I really, I just think we need to talk last run in general because um, I can make a case for either book. Uh, last road, and we talked about our stance on it. And I think the continued escalation in value of cover A up to a $40 book. Store exclusives are hitting like 100. Um, it, it really is a really the book of 2020. And I think it's going to be an important book in back issue bins. It's going to be a wall book for years to come. We've made that comparison to the killing joke. I stand by that comparison. I feel strongly about it. Um, having said that, while the first print had some like 160, 175,000 print run, which is very large, especially for a turtle book, especially for IDW book, it massively, massively short shipped. You had, um, you had uh, allocations to, on books that, that people had just ordered, as well as cutoffs getting put in. Um, and that, that book did not get satisfied the demand, hence why $8.99 cover price book sitting at $40 today. Um, so if we're talking about the begin with the second print, um, you know, you can be negative. I can be negative. I certainly don't love the cover, you know, the, you know, the same cover type deal. Um, but, but, and people will talk about the print run being 50,000, but I look at it and go, okay, 50,000 is still one third of the print run of the original book, uh, less than a third. Um, and again, people look at it like a variant. It's not the same book. It's a different book. Um, and I think that, Readers are going to pick up this book too because it, it, it's not selling out. It's available at a lot of retailers right now for cover price. So I think readers are going to pick up this book. It's one of those ones that's going to dry up over time. And I could totally see the second print selling for, say, 50% of what the first print is selling for. So the first print selling for 100, the second print can sell for 50, uh, which puts the current pricing uh, on the second print around $20. And I think it'll get there very, very, very shortly. Um, the demand for the last Ronin is incredible. And I think it's only going to continue as issue number two drops. The other one that released was that thank you variant, the kind of like foil uh, variant for number one. This was put out because of the allocation issue that IDW had. Um, they, they had a lot of upset retailers and they wanted to kind of make it up to them. Where I don't like this the book is the kind of the information that's going out there about this book because it's being called a one in 75 in seven. And that's not really true. Um, it is a one in 75, but you're capped off at five. So we produce an exclusive variant um, and we would have qualified for more than five. And we will cannot get more than the, uh, the five maximum allocation, which I th then makes it truly a larger ratio than one in 75 and extremely difficult to calculate. Um, what the true ratio is probably sitting more at like one in 90 to one in 100, um, but tough, tough to, to tell. Um, and when you look at the prices of what like the one in 10, which I think is undervalued right now, sitting at basically the same as cover A um, and the one in 25, which has gotten up to like 75, 80 bucks, uh, pushing towards a hundred consistently. Um, I think that this book long-term is one to be on the lookout for because it's going to have that uh, lowest kind of print run of one of the main uh, books. Certainly there's lower printed exclusives. We did an exclusive print into just 250 copies. Um, but uh, as far as the main release of this book. Now, how will people look at the fact that like the thank you variant got released the same time as the second print um, and not the first print? Will it be looked at as a second print? I don't know. I don't know how that's all going to shake out. I don't even know that it matters. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. Either way, continued bullish on Last Ronin. There were some other books I looked at where I felt like I could have made the argument for the long-term play, but I'm not betting against Last Ronin on anything. If you can pick up these books for cover price or ratio, uh, meaning if you can get the thank you for about 75 bucks, um, I think you're safe all day to buy it. Now, certainly the thank you is going for well more than 75 right now, um, but that's what we always advocate, stay around ratio when you can. Yeah, last Ronin, Jack's long-term play. If I were to pick Bolo List, if I were to pick a sleeper pick, I would probably go with Homesick Pilot System. I like think that's one uh, great story, great covers. I don't say it's a long-term play, but I think it's been overlooked. 
But with that being said, guys, let us know in the comments what books did you guys pick up this week? What stories are you enjoying reading? Especially if there's series that aren't on the Bolo list. That's how they get added. Create that buzz for those titles and they will get added into the reader buzz. But with that being said, this is Brian and Jack with some men's comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.